one fine morning somewhere in Samarahan district. Surrounded by oil palm plantations along a quiet road, I was on an adventure with a friend, Edward, to check out some relics of the bygone days left behind by early Japanese planters. The Japanese started coming to Sarawak during Raja Charles Brooks' time and although their numbers were few, they managed to leave their mark that marks an interesting history today. Present-day Samarahan Estate, site of Japanese relics. The former rubber plantation is now an oil palm plantation. So who started this plantation? Shozo Yorioka came to Kuching in October 1910 and his purpose was to ask permission from the third Raja Charles Viner Brook to have a rubber estate somewhere in the coastal area of Kuching and it was approved and he started uh, to plant rubber in 1914, four years later, uh, with 100 Japanese uh, personnel uh, together with their families and they have a bungalow in what is now the Samarahan estate. And uh, first of all, he wanted to plant 1,000 acres of rubber in this uh, low-lying uh, undulating uh, hills of Samarahan and there are also a big area of swampy land near the coastal area and uh, 3,000 acres was planted with rubber and later on uh, additional 1,000 acres he acquired uh, in 1918 and he also of, of the 4,000 acres he planted 200 acres with paddy and the paddy and the rubber were directly shipped to Japan. And this rubber estate, uh, both in Matang and Samarahan, belonged to a company called uh, Nisa Shokai. Uh, the present place where they have it be between uh, a village called uh, Kampong Sinyawan and Kampong uh, Jayaria along the uh, Samarahan uh, Syrian road, the new road, uh, that we can see the remains of uh, the, act the Japanese activities uh, even today. Another building from the early Japanese settlers. It was believed that during the Japanese occupation, this room was used to store armor and weapons. The stones throw away, there is a Japanese shrine known as Yuryoka Shrine. This is probably the only Japanese shrine in Sarawak. It was named after Yuryoka Shuzo, the man who started the plantation. The site of the shrine can be recognized by the red torii gate at the roadside. The torii gate was made from sakura tree wood 
brought in from Japan. At one stage, the Tori Gate and Shrine were on the verge of collapse until they were restored jointly by the Rotary Club of Kuchinjaya and Rotary Club of Tokyo Haneda. The project was headed by Madam Kazu Sakai, a long-term resident of Sarawak. The shrine can be reached through a short hike up the low hill. Another relic from that era is this structure. It is believed to be part of a boat. In the old days, there was a wharf nearby and river transportation was an important mode of transport. Another interesting fact is that during that era, a Japanese Seiji Kuno was appointed as a tua kampung in Kampung Seniawan for 19 years. Samarahan is not the only place with a Japanese past. There were two groups of Japanese staying in Sarawak at that time. Those who were in plantations like the Samarahan estate and those staying in towns like Kuching and Miri who were involved in various trades and professions. Some were even involved in prostitution. Those who lived in towns were believed to have arrived even earlier, sometime in the 1880s. In Kuching, they concentrated at the town center like in India Street and Kaiju Lane. You mentioned that around 100 of them eh, came to work yes, in the Yes, 100 States. Japanese employees okay. with their families. So besides these Japanese working in the estates, were there any other Japanese in, in Sarawak at that time and in yes. what profession yeah. were they in? They are, they are uh, Dr. Mutsi, um, let me see, yeah. Dr. Matsumoto Clinic at number 11 India Street. He operated a clinic there and we also have uh, a gentleman called Sige Kuno who is a herbalist and acupuncturist. Uh, he actually married a Malay woman from Samarahan, converted to Islam. Uh, they are also Japanese madam operating uh, in the red light district of what we today call the uh, Kaiju Lane. And the polite name for it in those days was Lorong Sempit, just behind the police station. Uh, all these uh, illegal activities took place there. At that time, it was legal by the British, uh, by the Rajas government. The small community of Japanese were able to blend in with the local community. Quite a number even started their families with local spouses. My grandfather came from Yokohama in Japan. My grandfather arrived here in 1913 and he married a local Badayu lady in 1916 and before he had a farm in Kwab under his Badayu wife name, that's my grandmother, he actually worked with the Matang rubber estate and also with the um, uh, Samarahan rubber estate. That was before he got married. As the community grew, a barrel ground was allocated for them. And that is why today uh, we have this Japanese grave near Batu Lintang, which uh, accommodate this uh, uh, about 30 or 4 Japanese who died here during the before the war.
and then World War II happened, and the era of the Japanese in Sarawak began to end. By the end of the Japanese occupation, there were two categories of Japanese in Sarawak. The first group were those who came before the Second World War, while the second group consists of those who came during the war. While the second group were in Sarawak mainly due to the war, the first group were long-term residents and many had set up their families here with local spouses and Sarawak-born children. Many from this first group wanted to remain in Sarawak as they were more at home here rather than Japan. However, it was not to be their decision to make as they were interviewed by the authorities who determined their fate. Worldwide, more than 6 million Japanese were repatriated. I have no information of how many were allowed to remain, but for sure, one of them was Hiroshi Kimura. Uh, he was a good friend of uh, Bishop, uh, the Reverend Peter House, who was the priest in charge of Kuap Parish. And uh, they were good friends, and towards the end of the war, it was uh, uh, Peter House who gave him a very good recommendation to the Australian military administration. So he was asked, he was allowed to uh, to stay back by the British colonial government. Kimura went on to become one of the most outstanding farmer, with his farm becoming a popular place with visitors. He even built a road leading to his farm which was named after him. The Japanese occupation changed the fate of the early Japanese settlers in such a way that the community more or less disappeared after the occupation as most of them were repatriated back to Japan. With the settlers mostly repatriated, only their local spouses and children remained. Other than that, there is not much evidence of their existence. Meanwhile, evidence of the Japanese occupation can still be seen in Kuching till present day. At the old courthouse, there is an extension that was built during the Japanese occupation. In front of the TM office, there is a stone marker believed to be from that era. Nearby, off Jalamu Road, is the Japanese cemetery as shown in the video earlier. A few hundred meters away is the prisoner of war camp which today is the branch campus of the teacher's training institution. Here, there is a flat post that survived from the Japanese occupation. Meanwhile, in St. Thomas's school, a few hundred forced laborers were housed in the school during the Japanese occupation. A swimming pool was built in the school compound but was uncompleted. It can still be seen until today. The Second World War brought devastating outcome to the early Japanese settlers of Sarawak. Families were separated because most of the Japanese were repatriated to their homeland. The once thriving community no longer exists. 
only memories and some relics are left behind. Thank you for watching this video.